one. Yeah. Okay, good. Hello, dear colleagues, dear guests. Uh, welcome to our lunchtime conference. It's just one in a whole series of conferences about fiscal issues uh, organized by Union Syndical Brussels and with the friendly support of our colleagues uh, from the Council section of Union Syndical. Thank you very much for uh, attending here in the press room, but I hope uh, that uh, there will be many others who follow our conference uh, remotely via the video streaming. And a big thank you goes to our interpreters who provide interpretation today in English and French. And it's really much appreciated, uh, um, especially for this subject uh, where I think there are uh, some quite specific uh, terms and uh, vocabulary involved in this uh, topic. So the topic here today is about international, um, international wealth and uh, cross-border inheritance uh, planning. International uh, estate planning is a very wide complex uh, issue and it involves uh, especially also transfers of assets and wealth to our uh, next generation. And it is already complicated, uh, and you know uh, you need some uh, knowledge about uh, financial and uh, tax aspects. And, uh, but if it comes to international cross-border transfers of assets, then it will be much more complicated. I'm therefore really delighted to uh, welcome today our guest speaker, Mr. Quagaber who is really an expert in this uh, field. He's a tax lawyer with a specialization in uh, international tax issues and international estate planning. And uh, he will present us today the key aspects of our topic with a particular focus on situation of individuals like many of us uh, who are uh, located abroad for professional reasons. So uh, we all have the pleasure today to benefit from the 39 years of experience from our speaker. Thank you very much for being here and I would like to give you the floor. Thank you. Good afternoon. It's afternoon already. Thank you for joining us in such huge numbers in the room and at home or in the office, sorry. I shouldn't have said that. Um, I'm going to try and speak slowly because I'm here, I'm being recorded. So um, what I'm going to do at the end is if I get a recording, type it out. And um, uh, I have a little booklet with uh, the information of EU officials and include the estate planning part in there. So today we're going to talk about estate planning for EU officials. The topic is actually much wider because there are also other officials of international organizations who are concerned by this. The difference is that they don't always have their tax domicile at home and they're usually uh, domiciled in Belgium. So for these people, I'll try and point this out, but consider yourself domiciled in Belgium. I'll just quickly present myself. I'm Mark Wagerber. I'm a lawyer. Avocat, and I've been specializing in taxation for 39 years. Thank you for pointing that out. That makes me elderly and wise, I hope. Um, my firm is called uh, Cabinet David, and we are specializing in cross-border taxation. Over the years, I've built up a lot of expertise of estate planning and um, tax planning for uh, individuals and um, the book you see on the left rest in peace, a guide to wills and inheritance tax in Belgium is the result of that. This one is a bit uh, older, there's a new one coming out in the beginning of next year. I have good news for you, if you want one solution for estate planning I have it, but you're not going to like it. Basically if you don't want any 
if you want to um, do all your estate planning, you give everything away. The only problem is you don't know how long you'll need it. So what is estate planning? Well, there are different aspects. The reason you're probably here is to minimize inheritance tax, but there are also other reasons for planning your estate. You may want to uh, make sure that you give what you want to who you want. The, the Rubens goes to Johnny and the Ferrari goes to Lisa. You want to plan for young children and you may, what happens if you go on a business trip or a mission and you don't come back? What happens to the children? And then if you have something to leave to your children, you don't want them to have it too early because there's bad substances, there's heavy cars that they could waste your money on. You don't want that. Estate planning is also about um, diffusing family conflicts. If you want to have fun in life and after you passed away you tell Lisa that there's a, bank, a secret bank account in Luxembourg and you tell Johnny that there's a safe in the basement, they'll be looking for ages and thinking the other one has taken it all. It's also a question of managing your finances when you're not able to do it anymore. When you're 93, you don't want to have to deal with money matters. You want ever just to be left alone. And that's why you give a lasting power of attorney so that your children or grandchildren or a friend can look after your money. And then finally, it's also a question of living wills. Now, what does it mean for EU officials, people who have come here to work for the Commission, for the Council, for Eurocontrol or other European organizations. This is basically for people who are covered by the protocol. So you have international tax issues. You live and work in Belgium, I hope. You have your tax domicile, uh, say in Sweden. You have a Greek wife. You have a holiday home in Italy. Your children are studying and probably going to stay in the U.S., your parents live in Spain. You also have a bank account in France for when you were working there. So basically, that gives a very messed up Rubik's Cube. Now, we're going to sort this out quickly for you. Now, usually it doesn't go that quickly, but um, let's have a look at some common mistakes. People say, I'm not Belgian. Some of you become Belgian. And it's not because you're not Belgian that it's not your concern. You can think we're covered by the protocol, so you don't need to worry about Belgian inheritance tax. That's not always the case, because you may be uh, paying Belgian inheritance tax, or let's say somebody will pay it after you, but you have to buy it with the Belgian inheritance rules. These are, if you live in Belgium, you can't get around those. Some of you think, we'll retire in Florida. It's the best of both worlds. We have a, a decent pension from the council and 249 days of sh sunshine. There were a bit less this year. And there's no income tax. But, and also no inheritance tax. If you have less than 12, 13 million, there's no inheritance tax in the US. But if you're an EU official, you have, or a retiree, you get a pension that's exempt in Belgium and the EU but that does not bind the Americans. They will want to see your tax money. So when you retire, you have to choose your tax domicile. And the question is like in a song, do I stay or do I go? Some people say, well, our estate planning is very simple. We made a will before we came from Ireland and I leave everything to my wife and she does the same. And that's practical. That's how we do it at home and there's no inheritance tax. Now, that's not the way it works in Belgium. And then some people are Austrian, Cypriots, Estonians, Latvians, Maltese, Portuguese, Slovak, Swedish. And there's no inheritance tax in these countries. Now, they've heard about the European Succession Regulation that says you can choose your own national law to govern your estate. But that does not mean that there's no inheritance tax in Belgium. You cannot opt for Swedish law and Swedish tax law. You pay, if you live in Belgium, you pay Belgian inheritance tax. So how about a Rubik's Cube? How do we get there? Well, when the founding fathers of the European institutions or what uh, 
the European Commission or whatever went before it, they decided to ha they had to deal with their EU officials. If not, they would only have Belgians. So they wanted to attract Italians, French, Germans. So they worked out the protocol and privileges and immunities. Basically, if you commit a crime as a member of um, staff, that's dealt with, but it also deals with taxes. So <clears throat> that deals with taxes for younger couples who come here, <coughs> but also for older couples who packed up and came to Belgium. Article 12 of the protocol is a tax exemption, and when you retire, it's your retirement pension that's exempt, but also the survivor's pension that your spouse or your partner will get. These are tax exempt in um, the country you live in. <coughs> Article 13 of the protocol deals with domicile. And basically, EU officials who come to Belgium keep their tax domicile. That's only for people who work for the Commission or uh, the European institutions. Euro control, for instance, is different. They do not keep their Italian or Spanish or Portuguese domicile, they become Belgian domiciled. So if they move only to join the institutions and only to work uh, in Belgium for the institutions, they keep their tax domicile. So an Italian who is hired from Luxembourg keeps not his Italian domicile, but his Luxembourg domicile. That's the place where he was rec um, recruited from. So it's always a tax domicile in the EU, and usually the member states from which you were recruited, but that's not necessarily the member states that you have of your nationality. So the Italian who's recruited from um, Luxembourg has a Luxembourg domicile, and that can get, make things a bit more complicated to, um, to keep uh, sorted out. That works for income tax, for wealth tax, there's not many wealth taxes for death duties, inheritance tax, and but not for gift tax and for the double tax treaties between the member states. So if you are domiciled in Italy and you have income in Belgium, it's a double tax treaty between Belgium and Italy that will determine who can tax. So <coughs> if you have your tax domicile at home, let's say in uh, Finland, then inheritance tax will be due in Finland on everything, but also in Belgium, but only on your house you have here in Belgium. In another country, Italy, for instance, if you house on the Lake Como, and in uh, Greece, if you have a little villa in the Peloponnese. On the other hand, if your tax domicile is in Belgium, then yeah, sorry, that can be because you were recruited from Belgium or because you stay in Belgium when you retire. In that situation, inheritance is tax and due as a principle in Belgium only the entire state. But if you came from Greece, there will be, and you have property in Greece, there will be inheritance tax in Greece on your property. If you have a house, summer house in uh, Lapland, there will be inheritance tax there. And if you've got a little uh, cabin in Sweden, there will be no inheritance tax there because Sweden doesn't charge inheritance tax. And then, of course, we can always have to remember that we're missing one of our member states. Brexit means that the UK is not bound by the European rules anymore and is, they're not bound by the protocol anymore. Now, there have been negotiations which resulted in the withdrawal agreement, and that means that the UK will play around, but, sorry, will play along with the protocol. It means that they will accept and uh, abide with the protocol, but only for officials who were in service before the 31st of December 2020. So that means that official, uh, UK officials um, will, um, when they retire in the UK, will not pay tax on their pensions, and they will also deemed to be deemed to have their tax domicile in um, the country where they uh, come from. Let's see, in practice, if you have an Italian EU official who works for some reason in the UK, for instance in the embassy there, or in the um, uh, representative office, he will be tax exempt in the UK on his remunerations, but he keeps his domicile at home uh, if he's uh, recruited from Germany, it will be Germany. 
Um, if an EU official retires in the UK, he will pay no tax on his pension in the UK. And an EU official hired from the UK keeps his tax domicile in the UK. That means that for all other income that he gets, not from the EU uh, institutions, but from uh, savings, will be liable to tax in Belgium. Now, that does not work for new EU officials who were recruited from 2021. They will be deemed to be um, dom uh, recruited from the country they were recruited from. And they will not be exempt in the UK. So if you have a young person <coughs> who has uh, Irish and English nationality uh, and has, is deemed to and retires in the UK, he will pay tax on his re uh, pension in the UK. So this is what is awaiting all of us sooner or later. So what happens when I die in Belgium? Now this is something that applies to both people. Uh, whether, uh, if you die in Belgium, whether you have your tax domicile in Belgium or not. You may think that's not my problem, but yes, it is your problem. You have to be aware of that. First of all, you may have heard the horror stories that your bank accounts are frozen, and that's true. It's both your personal accounts and joint accounts are frozen, and the reason is that the bank wants to make sure that uh, they give the money to the person who's entitled to the money. There's exceptions. The bank will pay funeral and medical bills, and the spouse or the civil partner or the registered partner can take up to €5,000 um, out of the account to cover um, uh, expenses with a maximum of uh, half. So it's um, if there's only 8,000 on the account, the partner or the spouse can take up 4,000 euros. How are the accounts released? Well, that's simple. Well, not that simple, always, not always that simple. You need a certificate of succession. That's usually the notary that writes out, Mr. So-and-so has died. He is succeeded by his wife. They have marriage contract of separate properties and they have three children. So the children inherit and the spouse gets usufruit under Belgian law. Something that's important is that the estate passes automatically in Belgium. That means that if you have two children, they automatically become the owners of your estate. In the UK, Ireland, common law countries, there is a process of a probate where somebody is appointed, an executor, to uh, take over your assets and then pay the tax and distribute them. This is not the case, but that means that uh, all the liabilities and the debt of the deceased automatically go over to the children. Now, the children can accept the inheritance, but they can also say, oh, no, we, we don't know, uh, there may be debt. And there's nothing worse than inheriting money from uh, a sugar daddy in America and then discovering that there is a big debt uh, linked to it. If you don't know, you can uh, accept, but with the benefit of an inventory, somebody will uh, have to make an inventory and see what uh, the net is. The benefit of the inventory is that, um, or the advantage is that you do not take on any, on, uh, any debt or liabilities that you didn't know about. If you live in Belgium, you have to do inheritance tax return, and there it's going to be different for people who have their tax domicile in Belgium or not. If you have tax domicile in Belgium, everything you have to declare. If you don't have your tax domicile in Belgium, it's only the real property you have in Belgium. Now, people think that that's an obligation for the notary. No, the notary is not in the driving chair. It's the heirs who are in the driving chair. The notary is only... Um, is only giving advice and helping with the inheritance tax return in practice. He decides or says this is what you have to do, but it's a real responsibility of the heirs. You have to file the inheritance tax return within four months. You can get the extensions or you can take, um, normally you can get an extension of two months until, until six months to pay the inheritance tax. Um, in, um, Sorry, um, and sometimes it's just simpler just to uh, take the penalties that are not necessarily that high for um, uh, filing late. Now, when we talk about inheritance, we have to decide what's in your estate, who inherits what, 
what's inheritance tax and what planning tools there are. So we can uh, plan with bills, with gifts, even with a marriage contract and uh, through contracts like insurance. Again, this is irrespective of your tax domicile. If you live in Belgium, it's the Belgian rules that apply, but the European succession regulation, I'll come back on that, allows you to opt for your Greek national law or your English or Irish national law that allows you to do certain things in a different way. So what's in your estate? Well, first of all, (coughs) your personal property. If you're not married, everything is your personal property, but if you're married then half a community property is your property as well. Now, what is community property? Well, that depends on your matrimonial uh, property regime. (coughs) Matrimonial property is what you acquire as a married couple and um, and how it's distributed. You can have community property. It means that everything you acquire after your marriage is jointly owned except for the motorbike that you had when you were 25 and the old furniture that's probably thrown out and the PlayStation, of course. You can also have community property and two personal properties, <coughs> which is usually only the old bike and the PlayStation, or you can keep everything separate. Then you have two personal pro- properties. There is a community property that's split half and half. You can have two personal properties and then only the personal property is in your estate. And then you can also have two personal properties. One is working, the other one is not working. So the one is working, is accumulating all the wealth on his account, and he can say, well, that's all mine, in case of divorce or in case of death. You can agree that there will be a repartition at the end so that everything is split, but only at the end. Who inherits? (coughs) Well, first of all, the children in equal shares, and that's all your children. And that was the problem with King Albert and uh, his daughter Delphine. Even uh, if she was recognized as a child, she inherits as well. Now it's official, she will get a quarter. Grandchildren will step in for their deceased ch- uh, for deceased children. If there's no children or grandchildren, then the parents and the brothers and sisters inherit. If there's no, bro- uh, no parents anymore, then it's the uncles and aunts and your nieces and nephews. And finally, because the Belgian state always needs money, the Belgian state inherits if the, no family can be found. And then you'll say, and what about the spouse? You're forgetting the spouse. Well, until 78, the spouse was forgotten. It's only since 78 that a spouse inherits. What does a spouse inherit? Well, if there are children, there's only an usufri. <coughs> I'll come back and explain what usufri is, but it's not very satisfactory always. If there's no children and your spouse inherits with uh, your brothers and sisters, then the spouse gets community property. If you have separate uh, properties, then you, the spouse will have the usufri of the, of the personal property, but that will go back to the uh, brothers and sisters, the, your own family. Registered partner, uh, civil partner, inherits usufri of the family home of the, and, the con- and the content. <coughs> that means that the family home will go back to the brothers and sisters, nieces and nephews. And if you're just living together, then the, your uh, partner gets nothing. So if you're in a situation that you have registered your partnership or if you haven't registered your partnership, it is very important that you make a will to make sure that your uh, partner gets something. So what's usufri? There's two words. It's in Latin words, usus and fructus, the use and the fruit, and that's the default solution in Belgium. If you don't make a will to change it, your spouse or your partner only gets usufri, and then things goes back to your family. It's use, the right to use a house, to live in a house, but also the fruit to rent it out and to have the rent to have the bank accounts and get the interest. But for instance, for the house, you receive the rent, but you also have the cost of the maintenance. So if you leave somebody just to use free of your property, you have to make sure that there's enough money left over to cover uh, the maintenance and repairs. On bank accounts, the usufruitier has the interest, 
the money is blocked on the account and then every year the interest is paid onto uh, your account. But that's not very satisfactory with the low interest rates. So you cannot use the capital that's on the account. So user free can be a poison chalice. So avoid giving, just giving the user free. Um, try and arrange for something. It's nothing worse than an 80-year-old lady who has the user free of a house with, you know, the maison free they have in Belgium, five floors and lots of stairs. She can't move out. She can't renovate it to make it uh, to uh, make sure it can be let out. So you have to make sure there is some money left over or at least a possibility to um, to maintain it. And it's also an opportunity because um, one of the planning techniques we will have is that a split purchase. When you sell your Maison Frit for a million and you buy an apartment for half a million, you can give the money to the children or part of the money to the children. You buy the Use Fruit the right to live in the house for the rest of your life, and the children buy their bare ownership after you give them the money. And then you're actually in a situation that you would be if you uh, inherit, but at least you've got an apartment with a lift that usually works, uh, rather than five uh, flights of stairs. I mentioned the European succession regulation. So basically, your inheritance passes, your estate passes according to the Belgian uh, inheritance rules, and um, that's the the law of your last habitual residence. If you live in Belgium, this is the Belgian rules that apply. Again, this is irrespective of your tax domicile. We'll come to the taxes later, but if you're domiciled in Belgium, the rules apply. If you're not domiciled in Belgium, the inheritance rules apply as well. But the European Succession Regulation allows you to choose for your Portuguese um, inheritance rules, not for the Portuguese inheritance tax. You have to do that in your will, but you have to uh, take care um, that you do not in, um, uh, infringe the forced airship rules. How do you make a will? Well, <coughs> you can just hand write it out. I. I'm of a sound, uh, sound mind, and I leave everything to the cat's home. You sign it, you put a date on it, and uh, if, as long as it's handwritten, that's a valid will. A notarized will is a will where you go to a notary and say, I want to make a will, I want to do this, this and that. And the notary says, well, you would not think that it might be a good idea to do it differently. He says, come back in two weeks' time, we'll have a will, and then you can sign it. And then there's something called an international will, that's a will that is typed out, put in an envelope, given to a notary, and um, even if it's called an international will, it's often used, it can be in another language than in Flemish or uh, French, um, but it's basically called an international will because it's based on an international um, regulation. A question I often have as well is, will my English will, because that's the most difficult ones, be accepted? I appoint an executor who will apply for probate. Will that work in Belgium? Well, we tend to look at the effect of the will, who does the person want to benefit, and who um, will receive anything from uh, the will. And then we usually apply that. As long as a will made when, uh, when you were living in the UK, for instance, if you have British citizenship, an English will will be accepted. I recently made a, a will uh, in English format, witnessed by two uh, witnesses for a person who was about to die here in Belgium, and um, that was acceptable both in Belgium and in the UK. Do you need a will? A lot of Belgians don't have a will. It doesn't mean that a will is not useful, but it can be useful to change in the testacy rules. For instance, you want to give the family home completely to your partner or spouse, and that can be useful for tax planning because there's no inheritance tax on the family home. So for tax planning, a will can be very useful. Of course, a will is to, used to decide who will receive what from your estate. If you have young children, you want to use the will to appoint a garden for the ch children. You may want to make funeral arrangements. Everybody at Kitty O'Shea is uh, after a funeral. Deny the children conversion of usufri. When the 
the spouse has usufruy and the children have better ownership, they have the right to ask for conversion, basically buy out their father or mother. <coughs> That's called conversion of usufruy. And in your will, you can say you cannot buy your uh, mother or father out. Then, of course, with your uh, succession regulation, the, um, th- this allows you to opt for your national law. For instance, you may want to disinherit your children in favor of your spouse. <coughs> what are the limitations of making a will? There's the forced airship rules, which is um, um, the funniest thing I had was people saying, well, why an airship? No, it's really the airship. Airship, the airs um, have to receive a certain reserve part. The children must receive at least 50%. It used to be three quarters for three children. And the spouse must have either usufruy of your estate or 50% of your estate or of your family home. The registered partner has no forced airship rights. Just to repeat again on the EU succession regulation, your will is governed by Belgian law. If you live in Belgium, you lost habitual residence. So a UK will has to abide with the Belgian law, the forced airship rules, but you can opt for your national law, English law, Irish law, Scottish law, uh, but you cannot opt for your national inheritance tax. So Swedes cannot opt for Swedish law just to benefit from the exemption of inheritance tax in Sweden. And uh, during the, while you're in service, do not forget a protocol that says that your tax domicile is um, the country where you were domiciled. A quick word on inheritance tax. Belgium is a country with three regions and three inheritance tax codes. It used to be one inheritance tax code. Each region has the power to make their own rules. And uh, they've done that and they diverged and now they're trying to converge again and apply the same principles. So inheritance tax is not due on the estate as a total, but is due on what everyone receives. So if you have three children, they each receive a third, they will pay inheritance tax calculated on the share that they receive. Uh, if you live in Belgium, then is uh, due on what you have in Belgium and what you have in other countries. If you're not um, domiciled in Belgium, then this is where the uh, diverges, then it's only on your Belgian estate. Be aware that in Belgium, inheritance tax is due in life insurance. I'll come back on that and gifts in the last three years. So if you make a big gift to somebody and they can't prove that it was given more than three years before you you died, then uh, inheritance tax will be due. Wallonia has just extended that uh, to five years, which is making um, estate planning a bit more difficult because you can say, well, I feel I'll still be there in three years' time. Five years at 93 is a bit more risky. of course, you can pay gift tax, and usually on movable, that's 3%. I'll get back on that. The, uh, by paying gift tax, you do, will not pay inheritance tax on the gift. And usually you can then have a date that determines when the gift was made. Um, the only thing on which there's no inheritance tax to is occupational pensions. Uh, that can be company pension, but also your state pension and the pension you receive from the European institutions or from um, <coughs> or from um, other official uh, other institutions in Belgium. That will not be liable to tax in Bel- no inheritance tax when your uh, partner receives a survivor's pension. Um, Important, and that, that's uh, especially important for estate planning, is that a spouse and the registered partner do not pay inheritance tax when they receive the family home. So one of the things I will advise you to do is make a will in favor of your spouse or partner to leave the um, family home to them because they don't pay inheritance tax and then they can postpone when inheritance tax is paid. The disadvantage is that there will be one home inherited by two children rather than half a home inherited by two children twice. 
So there is a technique called the bequest and cascade that you can say, well, look, I'll give you the house, but when you die, it, my part will come to the children from me and your part will come to the children from you, and that will then reduce the inheritance tax on the total. What are the rates of the inheritance tax? I'm not going to go into detail about those, but for uh, the direct family, spouse, partner, children, grandchildren, and parents, the rates start at 3% generally and go to 30%. Flanders, it's only 27%, and they split the inheritance tax on the real estate and on movables. If you have no children or no spouse or partner, then your brothers and sisters inherit and they pay tax at rates between 20 and 65 percent. Uncles and nieces and nephews, 25 to 70 percent, and all friends and strangers can pay up to 80 percent. Just to give you a better idea <coughs> and you, um, to, have a, uh, to see what your situation is, if you leave 10, 20, uh, 2,500 to 5,500 or 1 million, look at what region you're in, Brussels, Flanders or Bologna. And then if we have a look at the figures, keep in mind that the family home is tax exempt for your partner and that in Flanders, and that's 50-50, um, the tax is calculated separately on the family home and, uh, sorry, on the movables and on the real estate. If we look at the figures for a spouse and children, the first group, that usually is very low on the first, on smaller amounts, but then goes up to 24 to 22% at a million per person. Siblings, we start at 20 to 25%, going up to 50, 60%. Nieces and nephews, it's about 10, 5 to 10% more. And then complete strangers, we're looking at rates between 40 and, um, on average, 76%. Now, what's important here is what I put in uh, yellow. is for These are um, group rates. And in inheritance tax matters, a group rate is not advantageous that you pay less. The more people that join in the action to buy something, um, the tax is calculated on what they all inherit together as a group. Uh, an uncle of mine died, there were 26 uh, nieces and nephews, and uh, we each received two or 3,000 euros, but the tax was very high because there was 26 of us who received that amount of money. If we look at the situation of European officials, again, uh, people who work for other institutions do not have their tax domicile here, but if you have your domicile in Belgium, either because you were recruited from Belgium, because you worked for another institution, or you worked for European institutions and you decide to stay in Belgium for retirement, then inheritance tax is due in Belgium on your entire estate, even on properties in other countries. So if you have uh, a cabin in Sweden, there's no inheritance tax there um, in Sweden, but there will be inheritance tax in Belgium. If you have a property in Italy, the first one million is tax exempt per spouse or child. There will be no inheritance tax there, but there will be inheritance tax in Belgium, etc., etc. The other situation is for people who uh, have their tax domicile in the UK, sorry, in uh, another country uh, within Europe, they keep their tax domicile there. That means that inheritance tax will be due in that country, um, as if they were died in that country. And then, of course, in Belgium, they will also pay inheritance tax on Belgian real estate. That means for no inheritance tax for a partner, leaving the family home to your partner. But if you have a property that you, your children inherit, they will pay inheritance tax, possibly in the other country and in Belgium. And then there's a question of seeing how you can set off uh, inheritance tax in one country against inheritance tax in another country. And of course, in each other country where you have real property, inheritance tax will be due there. <coughs> so if you do not stay in Belgium, and you'll have to decide where you go. You may say, well, I'm going back to Croatia because that's where I come from. But you may think, well, the country has changed. I prefer to go to Portugal and I like the sun. And there, you can do that. But the, the 
there are a number of things you have to look at, which is basically the way of living, whether you speak the language, whether you like the medical um, uh, service you get there. A lot of uh, people who work for the institutions decide to stay in Belgium officially for certain reasons, but then live in another country most of the time. Going back to your country of origin or your nationality after 40 years may be a big disappointment. Oh, sorry, here. Yeah. It's not a good idea to press the on off button while you're speaking. Um, I know that a lot of Irish people went back to Ireland, they're from Dublin, but Dublin has become a huge capital now with lots of industry and service companies, and they basically come back and say it's not the same anymore. Now, if it's for inheritance planning, you may want to go to one of these countries because they don't have any inheritance tax. Now, Sweden may be too cold, Malta may be too far, Portugal may be nice, if you speak some Portuguese. Um, that these are countries that have no inheritance tax. Other countries have inheritance tax, but then you may want to plan around and see if you um, um, make sure that you don't have anything left at the time you, um, you die. Other countries have inheritance tax, but not for a spouse. So the black ones here are the same that have no inheritance tax. Of course, no inheritance tax for a spouse. But there's lots of other countries where a spouse does not pay inheritance tax. Think of Luxembourg, Poland, Denmark. And then there's other countries that have inheritance tax, but not for children. That's usually the same countries. Other countries have inheritance tax, but very low rates. For instance, Ireland, uh, Italy children and family spouses don't pay inheritance tax on the first million, and above that, the inheritance tax is 4%. So it may be a good idea to go and live in Italy just for the reduced inheritance tax rates. And then there are countries that have some inheritance tax, and then the red ones have a lot of inheritance tax. Now, Spain shouldn't really be in there anymore. The highest tax rate is 34%, but in most uh, com um, autonomous communities, there is a 90% exemption. So let's have a look at a couple of examples. <coughs> so an Italian... You're Italian, aren't you? Mr. Scano is uh, an Italian EU official who was hired from Italy for this example. So he has his tax domicile in Italy. If he dies in service, not if he stays and lives here after he retires, then there will be Belgian inheritance tax on the family home. So what I would advise him is say, well, make a will to leave your family home to your spouse. There will be no inheritance tax. And then make a bequest in cascade and you really say, well, I'm leaving it to my spouse, but when she dies, it comes half from me, half from children, to reduce the inheritance tax rates. In Italy, there will be inheritance tax on his worldwide estate, <coughs> but <coughs> wife and children pay, don't pay inheritance tax on the first million, and they only pay 4% above that. The house in Belgium will be uh, taxed more uh, at a higher rate. And if it goes to brothers and sisters, they pay 6% over 100,000, so it's not too much. Now, if our Italian or EU official had been hired from Luxembourg, the situation is different. We, in Belgium, the same rules apply. Make, leave the family home to each other and then to the children. If there's a flat in Florence, that will be uh, maybe exempt of inheritance tax in Florence. Um, but then inheritance tax will be due on everything in the country of his tax domicile, and that's Luxembourg. So inheritance tax there is due on the worldwide estate, even property in Belgium and property in Italy. But the good thing is, in Luxembourg, a wife and children don't pay inheritance tax. So in fact, the only inheritance tax that will be due is inheritance tax on the family home upon the second death. Now... <coughs> Let's complicate things a bit. Imagine that our Italian EU official has a son in France. He will pay inheritance tax when he inherits because France 
Germany, Poland, Ireland are countries that tax uh, charge inheritance tax when somebody receives an inheritance tax an inheritance uh, Spain as well. Uh, in France, the first hundred thousand is exempt, <coughs> but then after that, the rates go up from five to forty five percent. So there is some planning to be done. So on a million, for instance, the tax will be 212,000. Uh, there is some planning to be done if the, there, is, there are children in um, Belgium and in France, you leave everything to the children in Belgium during your lifetime, so that it then is redistributed upon death, and for a situation of death there is uh, a double tax treaty between Belgium and, um, and France to avoid double inheritance tax. Um, if he has a daughter in Ireland, she ha pays an inheritance tax when she inherits. The first 335,000 euros is exempt, but above that the rate is 33%. So the inheritance tax on receiving inheritance tax can be um, quite high. Now, if we have a Spanish EU official with a Spanish tax domicile, for Belgium we advise the same thing, leave the family home to each other. But then Spanish inheritance tax is due on the worldwide estate of the beneficiary if he lives in Spain. So if, <coughs> the, if you have a situation that um, somebody who is Spanish domiciled and has children who live in Belgium, there's no inheritance tax. If he lives in Belgium and the children live in uh, Spain, they will pay inheritance tax because they uh, receive the, the benefit. Now, in Andalusia, Madrid, and Sevilla, for instance, there are huge bonificaciones, which is exemption of inheritance tax or reduction of inheritance tax. I'm giving that example to try and make it simple, but it probably just confuse things. It's all a question of what is a specific situation that you have to take account of. So, start planning, and you can plan with wills, with gifts, with marriage contracts, and with insurance policies. I'll just give a number of examples of what you can do to, um, to make your planning. And then we, um, the, some of these work in other countries as well. If you decide you want to go and um, end your life in a retirement, go and retire in another country, these may have to be adapted according to the situation, if there's inheritance tax, for instance. So planning with wills. As I mentioned before, give your family home to the partner because no inheritance tax on the Belgian property. Give full property rather than usufruit because then your partner has the right to sell the house and or rent it out and make the best out of it. Um, you have to take account of force airship that you don't give too much, but usually the children are uh, quite understanding and possibly have to opt for national law to do that. Or um, you can, as it were, disinherit your children by putting property in community property and leaving that to each other with a uh, marriage contract. I'll come back on that uh, in a minute. Um, of course, if you leave the family home to your spouse, there will be more inheritance tax on the second death. The reason is that um, basically it's one home inherited by two children, upon the second death, no inheritance tax on the first death, but on the second death. And then more, there's more inheritance tax on the second death because they, two children in one house of one million, they pay inheritance tax on 500,000. If we use what I call a bequest and cascade, first to the parent, uh, surviving parent, and then to the children, um, you can say, well, look, I give it the house to you now, you can do with it what you want, but whatever stays the house or if you sell it the money has to go to the children as if it came from both of us together so instead of two children inheriting one house for one million and paying inheritance tax on five hundred thousand there is there's two children that receive two hundred fifty thousand from each parent um, and pay much less inheritance tax <coughs> planning with wills the spread your inheritance tax if that's what you want to do the more heirs you have, the less inheritance tax they will pay. Um, if, for instance, you, you look at a situation, you leave half a million or a million to one child, the inheritance tax is 17 or 24 percent. But if you leave it to a child and four grandchildren, the inheritance tax will be much less because it's reduced. Uh, 
Of course, you need to think about whether that's a good idea to leave lots of money to children and grandchildren. Um, there are techniques for that as well. Uh, for instance, with brothers, uh, if you leave everything to one brother or to four siblings, the inheritance tax will be reduced by spreading it over many beneficiaries. Um, <coughs> just keep in mind that if you live in Brussels or in Flanders, the inheritance tax rates are a group rate so that uh, everything they inherit together is added up and not calculated separately for each of them. You can also plan with wills and skipper generations. They will look <coughs> instead of giving 500,000 to one child who will then leave it uh, in turn for their children, you can give it to your children and grandchildren together, either you give each 100,000, or you can do it indirectly and give 500,000 to your children, but with the obligation to keep 300,000 separate for the grandchildren later on. So by that, doing that as well, you spread the inheritance tax over children and grandchildren. And possibly you can say, well, look, uh, I give you that money, but you will owe 100,000 to each of your children from me at a later stage. Um, you can also um, plan with by giving to charity. Charity uh, Charities only pay 7% inheritance tax, uh, none in Flanders. Um, but there is a technique called Le Grand Duo that's not possible anymore if you live in Flanders. But it basically means that you give everything to a charity and with an obligation to give a part to <coughs> your family. And that can be 45 to 55%. And that is, uh, can result, especially if you have a um, family that's far away or not uh, nieces and nephews or grand nieces and grand nephews that will pay the highest tax rates. So then the charity pays the bequest to the family. They get 45 to 50% rather than 25%. They pay the inheritance tax for the family and they pay 7% on the rest. That's how far you can go with, um, with wills. What Belgians do is they do a lot of planning with gifts. It means that they gift their house they give their investments to their family, but they keep usufrui, which is basically the right to get the income from the property. Um, in Belgium, there's gift tax, but only if you make a gift before a Belgian notary, and sometimes that can be advisable just to uh, add uh, conditions to your gift. On real property, the rates start at 0 to 150% for a direct family, and then on the brackets above that goes up to 9, uh, 18 and 27 percent. But you can give in tranches of 150,000 and uh, you can keep usufruit. So you can gift your house, but keep the usufruit the right to live in it for the rest of your life uh, or to receive the rent uh, for the rest of your life. But at least the property is transferred in the name of the, of the family of the children. If you have other beneficiaries, nieces and nephews, then it's also 10% going up 20, 30, 40% on real property. The one main uh, planning technique is for movables. The tax rate is 3%, it's a bit more in Wallonia. And if you leave to others, nieces and nephews, the gift tax is only 7%. Five and a half in, in Wallonia. So that can be quite effective, especially to <coughs> Um, transfer your property to your children and that can be advantageous as well to do that before you um, go to another country put the property in the name of the, of the, of the children so that you, you end up with nothing there except the right to uh, the usufruit of the property or the investments there's no hand gift tax on hand to hand gifts uh, a hand to hand gift is basically you send the registered letter to your son or daughter saying meet me in the branch of the KBC in uh, Place Schumann and I want to make you a gift. You tell the KBC that you want 5 million in uh, small uh, coupure, in small uh, notes, and they won't be happy, but if you insist they'll do it. Um, they will have probably a whole security team to make sure it's there. 
you take out five million from your account, you push it over to the side of your son or daughter, and they put it on the bank account there, and they send you a registered letter afterwards to um, say thank you, and then you have the date on which the gift was made. The only thing you have to do then is live for another three years or five years if you live in Olonia. Uh, it can also be done validly by bank transfer, and KBC will prefer that, and usually they um, they uh, prefer that and will advise and help you with doing that. It used to be a, a good idea to make a gift before a Dutch notary, because then the date could not be contested by the tax authorities, but that's finished. And or if you gift, if you have property in another country that does not have gift tax, a gift of real property to your children can be tax efficient because there's no Belgian gift tax on those. Of course, you have to live for another three years, but often, uh, if not, inheritance tax is due. And the gift before the Dutch notary is uh, uh, forgotten. Uh, we called that recently the uh, cheese route. Uh, for obvious reasons, the cheese route is closed. Planning with uh, gifts offers certain opportunities, a basic gift real property, and you can give tranches of 150,000 to your children if you and your partner or spouse have a house worth a million. Uh, you can give 150,000 to your three children, that's 450, and your partner could do the same thing, is 900,000 given, and then three years, and a couple of days later, you can give the property to, uh, you can give another tranche uh, to your children and pay 3% again. And by paying the 3% gift tax, there's no further inheritance tax. You can keep usufruit. Um, even if you give, it does not reduce the uh, gift tax rate, but uh, it's a valid technique um, to transfer your property to your children. The Opportunities as well as if you sell your maison frit and you downsize to flat with a comfortable lift and a, a little balcony, you can, as I mentioned before, get, uh, sell it. There's no capital gains tax in Belgium. Sell the family home. You give some cash to the children. They you do split purchase. The children buy the new the bare ownership, the right to the house, and you buy usufruit. That's the right to live in the house for the rest of your life. If you buy something worth, uh, if your house is a million and you buy something worth 500,000, you pay 3% gift tax on the 400,000 that children would have to pay. You pay 100,000 and um, then the property is in the name of the children and you still have another four or 500,000 left to spend for the rest of your life. <clears throat> if you have people who have only personal properties and no community property, you can gift it to each other. So you have a million together, you split it, you give 500,000 to your spouse or partner, he gives 400,000 to, to you, and that's a reciprocal, reciprocal gift. Gift tax is due 3%, but only on half a million. And you can provide that when you die, uh, your mon the money that you receive will go back to your um, your partner, or if your partner goes before you, it comes back to to you without inheritance tax or gift tax. A gift in cascade or bequest in cascade is you give to spouse first, and then um, afterwards when your spouse dies to a second beneficiary, children is a gift in cascade, and the gift tax is calculated twice, the first gift from you to your spouse or partner, and then a gift to you, to your children or nieces and nephews, and that can be uh, 7% instead of inheritance tax, 20 to 60%. Um, planning with a marriage contract, as I said before, is if you don't have community property, you can put everything in community property and put a clause in that the survivor will get everything. <coughs> Or you can opt for um, uh, separate properties and uh, a participation in a readjustment of the values upon uh, death. And you can uh, split everything 50-50 and then make a gift to each other and uh, pay 3% on the gift of one. Uh, planning with life insurance is a, another possibility that's often done. 
you can take out life insurance to pay the inheritance tax, that will be due. But if you take out the, inherit the uh, insurance, inheritance tax will be due on the policy. So what you do is <coughs> you make sure that you give your, your children, uh, um, your heirs or your legatees money to pay out life insurance to pay the inheritance tax that will be due. And then no inheritance tax will be due on um, on the payment of the by the insurance company. Joint life, second death. It means that you and your spouse put money in a life insurance policy, and life insurance policy is often used for investments. And one of you can put a million in it, the other not. <coughs> and uh, it means that if you die uh, upon the first death, there's no inheritance tax. The inheritance tax is only due on the first, on the second death, but the survivor can take the money out. Um, what happens in life is that the wife has a big company pension of three million. She puts that in an insurance wrapper. Uh, it's basically an investment wrapped in insurance policy. And she dies after a year, and the husband can take out three million for the re during the rest of his lifetime. Now, the tax authorities didn't like that much. They said, well, there, there's something wrong there because you're taking money that you should have inherited. So they, after 30 years, they came to a reasonable solution. They said, okay, we'll assume that half is your money and half is the dead person's money. You can take it half without inheritance tax. But if you take up more than half, you will pay inheritance tax. Okay, and basically inheritance tax is due when you take out more than what you put in or more than half. You can also take reciprocal insurance policies and go over that quickly. That, that's a bit more technical. But basically, the message is start planning and don't put it off. People think, well, we've got time, we're still alive. But um, don't put it off and keep your plan up to date. Don't wait too long accidents happen, you're not getting any younger to the country, how's your health, do you have children living abroad, are you planning to move back to your country, so there is a lot of planning that needs to be done during your lifetime and when you are um, uh, planning your estate and if you want to give Belgian property and you have to do that over periods of interages of 150,000 that can take some time to, to organize. Something else, please don't leave us a mess. It happens all too often that we come, the children or the, usually the nieces and nephews come and say, well, we don't know where to find the will and last wishes. We don't know what bank accounts there are. We don't know who inherits with the nieces and nephews, but we don't know if you're the beneficiaries. So I usually advise people to set up a personal asset list with a file with all their documentation and that it makes it easier to find. If you're married to Carnet de Mariage, bank accounts, insurance policies, keep them in one place. Uh, property deeds, not really necessary. They can be found, but property deeds of um, properties in other countries are useful to find and also make sure that we can find your will if you have one. The best thing to do, even if it's a handwritten will, is to leave it with notary because then there is a note made in the central register of wills. Everybody here is already thinking about estate planning and about retiring and uh, in that situation I strongly recommend that you set up a lasting power of attorney. That's for to cover a situation when you cannot take care of yourself anymore financially because you have dementia, Alzheimer's, Parkinson's, old age, because the children are far away and you can't deal with everything. And usually we make a blessing power of attorney to each other. Uh, and then when you're getting older with the children, the alternative that you do not want is that your friends realize you're uh, having slowly getting more and more dementia. And if you don't make any... Um, the, uh, they don't give a lasting power of attorney. Your nieces and nephews may go to the, uh, the court and uh, ju the justice of the peace and say, well, look, uh, our aunt has to be taken care of because she's spending her big uh, pension from the European institutions. 
uh, and it's basically coming to us. So appoint a lawyer who will limit what money she has, put her in a retirement home and uh, basically take care of her, but at a limited cost. Um, you don't want that. It's preferable to do that before, set up a lasting power of attorney before a notion because it has more value and it can give a power of attorney to sell your house, decide who your representatives are, in case your representative or your trustee dies before you have a deputy and determine when they start. Before ending, I will want to advertise the TEP Talks our office organizes. TEP stands for, they're not the TED Talks, but the TEP Talks, Tax and Estate Planning Talks. So there are a number of things that um, could be useful. We start again in November, uh, expatriates and impatriates. That's not for expatriates for working for the institutions, but it's a special tax regime we have in Belgium. Estate planning for dummies is yes, an introductory course to estate planning. Estate planning is very important when you have no children. We give uh, an introduction as well to taxes for EU officials. We also do uh, a presentation like this one for estate planning for officials. Uh, estate planning of wills with gifts separately and then issues with trust. If you have a trust, how does it work in Belgium? You can find those on uh, the website of our firm. These are not on yet, but if you want to be kept informed, send an email to david at davidlaw.be. And then these are my contact details again, and this is where question time starts. So the floor was mine. I hand it back um, if anybody has any questions. Um, just just a little second. We are not many in the room, but still I would very much like, if possible, the questions to be limited to um, issues of general interest, which may interest as many as possible of people who are here and those who are at home or in the office following remotely. And for uh, more specific questions, I would invite you to make an appointment with our speaker today, and uh, well, it would be impossible here to, to speak, to answer questions concerning several countries, several nationalities, several incomes, and several properties. So, if possible, general question. Thank you very much.